oh, now it works. Awesome. <clears throat> Welcome to Kernel Recipes uh, part, what is it, five? Um, if we account for the breaks. This is going to be an amazing talk about something that is completely not kernel related and not even really Linux related. But you will still like it because it is basically the same low level things that we usually take care of in, in kernel space. So uh, who am I? I'm Alex Graf. Uh, I work for SUSE mostly as a virtualization developer. Um, that is really the day job. Um, recently, during the last couple of years, I got involved in ARM. And thanks to ARM, I got involved in firmware. And thanks to firmware, I actually started writing uh, UEFI support in U-Boot, which is a presentation from Embedded Recipes, if you want to take a look at it. Um, and that got me involved in the whole UEFI story. And that way, I was one of the few people probably in this universe that know both UEFI and QEMU code, which uh, is a really, really rare combination. So you'll enjoy that. Now, what, what is the actual problem we were trying to solve here? Why do we put QEMU in uh, UEFI, if you didn't um, spot that from the, from the uh, symbols? The, the problem is if you, if you buy a server, if you buy an ARM server and an x86 server, and you go ahead and you plug in a graphics card, right? what happens? Well, first off, you attach screens, obviously, right? And then on your x86 system, everything is perfectly fine. The system comes up, and you show, it shows graphics, and it shows you everything that you want, and it just is awesome. And on your ARM system, nothing happens. Well, why is that? Right? That's, 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 I mean, it's been a curiosity for people that are new to PCs. Um, but really, at the end of the day, what happens is this, uh, the driver that your firmware, so the, the first part that runs on your uh, boot up, the driver that it needs to drive the video adapter, that one comes from within the graphics card. So the graphics card actually delivers the binary blob driver to your firmware to execute it. Now, because pretty much every system out there these days is x86, that driver is x86 code. And running x86 code on ARM can work, but we get to that. So uh, a couple, I think last year, um, during Linaro Connect, uh, we had a short discussion with Cavium, and they said, well, we have ARM servers, and we have these amazing uh, QLogic network adapters, and if you plug them together, you can't boot one from the other. It, it, it's this weird situation. Um, and obviously, they wanted to fix that for real and do real ARM drivers for the network adapters, but that takes a while, and it also requires more space on your, on your option ROM, on your flash, uh, which you might not be able to do on older parts. Um, so I started working with Art from Linaro uh, to brainstorm on what really would a, a good solution would be. And we eventually, we came to the conclusion that maybe x86 is not such a bad bytecode after all. But to figure out what the difference is, um, let's take a look at what ARM and x86 really, why, why they're even different in the first place. So, so the most obvious thing that comes to mind is uh, registers. Who has not heard of registers on CPUs? Okay, I can probably do this fast then. Um, registers are basically just small storage pieces that you put values in, data in, and then you can operate on them. So you don't operate on, on mem memory directly, usually you only operate on, on registers, depending on your architecture. Um, sometimes you can also do something with register and memory. It's very rare that you can also do something on memory and memory. But usually use these as small storage pieces uh, to put in values uh, that you want to access really, really fast. And then you have something called instructions, which uh, tell the CPU what to do. And basically, all, everything boils down to uh, simple instructions that say something like, go and copy this value from this register over to this register. Right? And you can see that the naming is already very different. But even the instruction encoding and the instruction naming and everything is just very different. They're, at least they're both called move on x86 and ARM to copy one, uh, a value from one register to another. But over here, you can see the encoding that the CPU actually reads. The CPU doesn't read the name of the, or the assembly of the instruction. It reads a binary representation of it. And that looks completely different. That's like, they're worlds apart. They, there's no chance your ARM CPU will even remotely understand what that x86 language is. It's as if you were speaking Chinese and you never knew even that it existed. But to the rescue, um, there is a project out there, an open source project called QMU, that is able to translate between arbitrary instruction sets. So it basically goes in, takes one instruction set, puts that into, into an intermediate language, and generates the output language, uh, the output instruction set from that again. 
<clears throat> so what is QMU really? I mean, it doesn't, it's not obviously just only a CPU emulator. It can do way more, right? So one thing that QMU has is a mode called system emulation, which is the one that probably most of you are familiar with if you've ever used uh, KVM, because that basically uses that, just only with a few accelerations. So imagine your computer um, has hardware, it has an operating system running on that hardware, and then it has a user space running on, on that operating system. And what system mode does is it basically emulates the whole thing. It emulates your CPU, it emulates your disk drives, it emulates everything that you have, everything is fully emulated, you're running in this, basically in a complete matrix, right? Now, another mode that QEMU does is called Linux user. And Linux user allows you to only run user space application as emulated. It basically goes in and says, this is my syscall interface, um, this is how my application talks to Linux, I can just write really small trampolines to convert from one in architecture to another architecture's syscall interface, and then only emulate my user space parts. This is about 10 times faster than mode before. So this is something you usually want to use if you want to be fast. But it obviously comes with its downside and it doesn't really help us for this project because really at the end of the day we want to run something in firmware and firmware runs directly on our hardware, right? It really is operating system and user space and everything in once. I mean, there's, there's only this one really big blob entity that is our firmware. So how does this firmware thing really work? I mean, how, what abstraction levels do we have? How, where, where can we plug our emulator into even if we want to run uh, random code from somebody else? So to understand that, we need to understand what UEFI interfaces are. And for that, um, imagine a computer, whatever it is, usually has peripherals, right? You might have a disk drive, you may have a, uh, it's our VGA adapter, you may have a network adapter, you could potentially have a CD-ROM drive if you're really old fashioned. And each of these usually have corresponding drivers in your firmware and they all connect to the core and then that basically allows you to represent these objects as UEFI objects and then access them later on. There you go. Uh, so that an application, like for example Grub, there's a Grub EFI variant, so you can run Grub. Grub can then go in, call UEFI, tell UEFI, please give me the handle for this disk drive that gets the handle, and then it goes in and can actually access that drive to maybe load Linux. Linux goes in, says UEFI, please go away, I don't need most of you now, then it removes most of itself and then you basically live in the Linux world. So far so good? UEFI in a nutshell? Okay, awesome. So how does this whole driver binding thing work? I mean, this is where we need to plug in. Driver binding works um, by a protocol uh, called install multiple protocol interfaces. It's amazing names. Um, this is part of the boot services. So in, in UEFI land, you have this difference between boot time services and runtime services. Boot time services is what you usually use in, before Linux starts and runtime services is what's available before Linux starts and even after Linux is up. But you don't really want runtime services most times. So this is all boot time uh, because we, while Linux is running, you don't need drivers from UEFI anymore, right? It's the, you want Linux drivers there. So in this install module protocol interfaces uh, function callback, you pass in a struct and in that struct you just say, well, I'm a driver and I can handle devices and please install this driver object for me now. So it goes in and installs this driver object based on the description you gave it in that struct. Now, the, you have a PCI core as well in a PCI driver somewhere, and the PCI driver finds a PCI card that is plugged in, so it tells the UEFI core, or it, it tells the UEFI core that there's a new PCI device, which means now the UEFI core can go in and ask every other driver object whether they are compatible to this new PCI device object that just got handled in. If it didn't follow, it's not overly important. The really important part is that you um, take a look at the structs and just see how diverse they are. Um, sometimes you have function pointers somewhere random, sometimes you have data somewhere random. So take a look at the structs and just um, breathe the feeling of UEFI. It's amazing. Um, and then you basically go in and say, driver, go ahead and, and start this device now, and then they bound and you can basically have the driver actually take care of that device and potentially create a new device based on that, like for example, a block storage device. So if you have a um, SATA adapter that you plugged in and a SATA driver, the SATA driver can now go in and create a SATA disk object 
that again is following the protocol interfaces notions where you have again that whole struct that you had in the first place to create an object, and there you go, you now have a disk object that you can access. So if later on uh, you have some application like Grub, and Grub wants to go and access the disk, it can go and do that by basically just calling that function callback. So everything in UEFI is a flat address space and everything is done via function callbacks. <clears throat> what does that mean if we virtualize? I mean, where, where do we set the boundary? In, in full system emulation mode, it's easy, right? We emulate hardware and the hardware to OS boundary is incredibly trivial. I mean, it's, it's very straightforward <clears throat> because these guys need to design uh, hardware against very hard specs, so it's very easy. Um, the operating system to user space ABI is also pretty well documented and you know exactly where the boundary is because you don't want to have things from one side leak to the other too much. But in UEFI, nobody cared about any of that. It's, it's just one big piece of everything. So we need to make sure that we can actually isolate things. And to isolate them, we need to make sure that we, every time we have shared data structures, they actually can be shared. So how do we share this data structure? I mean, if we take a look at the binary representation of this data structure, um, who can read little endian? It's trivial, right? You just read from the left. It's a one, revision one, either way. Um, it's a 64-bit value, and then you have a couple of pointers, and they're 64-bit values, um, because we're running on a 64-bit platform. And if you happen to run on ARCH64 and on XD664, that structure will always look the same. You will always have a U64 in the front, in front that is always 64-bit long, and then your pointer is always also 64-bit long. So you can actually start imagining that you could share that data structure between x86 code and ARM code. There's really nothing that could prevent you from it, except for maybe padding. Anybody heard of padding before? Ooh, awesome. So padding, padding is this thing where uh, you basically start off with one field that is smaller than the field afterwards. But the field afterwards ideally would like to be naturally aligned. There are a couple of data structures that want to be naturally aligned, like, uh, for example, pointers really want to be naturally aligned because you can access them much faster than in the CPU. It doesn't get you into unaligned accesses. So <clears throat> what the compiler does for you there is that if you write a struct like that, it really does not put the structure in memory like this. It puts the structure in memory like this. You have a gap. And that gap is called padding. That's really just the word for it. It really just means that after that 32-bit value, you have another four bytes of garbage in your data structure that are get, getting completely ignored and only after that follows your, um, follows your pointer. Now, this is true for x86, 64, and for ARM64, just the same. There's no difference. They basically follow the same ABI when it comes to padding. Everything looks pretty much the same data structure-wise. So we can actually share data structures now, right? So the world is great. We share data structures. We are all good. So we can just run our ARM grub and call into a function that we read from this shared data structure. Anybody finds the problem? OK. So to figure out what calling means, we need to first take a look at what calls actually are, right? What does is, what is a function call really translate down to? A function call is when you have a couple of arguments to a function. And then what the, that really means in the CPU is you really just take those arguments in your function call and put them into registers that then the other side of that call can pull out again and understand, well, I probably had these four arguments. You save a couple of auxiliary register or auxiliary state on the stack and jump. This is your program counter. This is basically the, the, the register that tells you where in the instruction flows you are. You set your program counter to the, uh, to the new function and at the same time your link register back to uh, where, where you want to jump to when you are done with the function. <coughs> so the next instruction usually. Uh, that Position counter now, the program counter, however, is x86 code. So how do we call x86 code from ARM code? It would just interpret all of that as a huge giant of garbage, right? It's like there, there are no instructions that your ARM CPU could actually read from there. There's this really, really nice feature in any modern CPU called no execute. Uh, no execute is actually a security mechanism. So no execute was used by 
uh, security people back in the day. This is, this is very new. It's like this is Pentium days. So it's only been around for 20 years, I think. Um, Nexecute is uh, used where basically in, in addition to uh, privileges where you can say, well, you can read from this page and you can write to this page, you can now also say you can execute or you cannot execute this page. And what we can do is if we load our XCD6 code into a certain region, we can just mark that as no execute, which really means to the CPU every time it wants to jump into any of those regions, we don't allow it to. Right? You, you just can't jump into any of those regions, which then again means we are in a trap handler, and in a trap handler, we can do whatever we like, including call into our emulator code. So now what we have in, UE, in, the, UE, in the UEFI core, we have a protocol called the uh, emulator protocol, which then can hook into the uh, no execute handler. And that one can go in, and when the no execute, inst uh, the no execute exception happens, we can go in and take all the registers from our ARM ABI convert them to XCD6 ABI on the fly, because we know we're in a call, somebody just called us, otherwise we wouldn't have jumped into our address space. <coughs> Do a few tweaks to our ABI, because some registers that are passed in, some parameters that are passed in registers on ARM are passed in the stack on XCD6, so we might need to fiddle with stack layouts a bit. We actually need to set up a full new stack for our XCD6 virtual machine as well. And then we can just run x86 code in that virtual machine. So now we can actually jump from ARM code all the way straight into x86 code. It's easy, right? Just thanks to no execute. Well, turns out we sometimes want to even call ARM code from our x86 code. Because, because for example, something like malloc is an ARM instruction, uh, is, is, is written in ARM instructions, right? And then that other function might want to call a callback that again is actually x86 code. And, well, you, you get the idea. Um, what we know is we know which range we put our x86 code into. So in the emulator, we can just check every time we branch, is this in range? And if it isn't, well, I guess we just go and do the reverse, right? Just take, we know that if we jumped out of x86 code, that must have been a call. So let's go and, uh, oh, there was one slide too much. Sorry. So let's go and you get the idea. Uh, let's go and convert our ABI from x86 all the way back to ARM so that we can call an ARM function. As easy as that, which means we're now at a state where we can call from ARM code, x86 code, then ARM code, and then x86 and ARM, and x86 and ARM, and you, you, can, you, you get the idea. Um, we now have emulation on a function level boundary. I mean, just imagine you had code that is half one architecture and half another architecture and you just link them together. This is basically what this does. Does it work? Uh, yeah, this is me uh, in front of a monitor that is driven by an NVIDIA card that has an x86 option ROM running in a AMD Seattle ARM server. This is just using normal protocols. This is actually Grub driving that graphics driver at this point. So this is an ARM Grub version that just draws that picture. So why do we use TCG in the first place? Um, what, what's the important thing about TCG? Why is TCG so awesome? Um, why do we use QMU, really? Um, so the QMU code base uh, has something called TCG, which is the tiny code generator, uh, that is a very, very self-contained piece of dynamic recompilation code. So it can just take arbitrary uh, instructions from one architecture, put them into another architecture. It's all written in C. It's uh, all written in LGPL, sometimes even BSD code, which is quite important if you are living in one address space. I did not want to get into legal problems with GPL code pulled into uh, official firmware images from vendors. And it supports x 64 I tried really hard to find a project that basically allows me to do what I wanted to do without TCG, because TCG is a full just-in-time compilation engine. It actually really literally generates x86 code. It's not an interpreter. It doesn't go in and looks at the instructions and says, oh, I should probably need to do this. It really generates x86 code, uh, ARM64 code in that case. Uh, but I couldn't find anything that was C, had a non-GPL license, and, well, 
supported x 64 because everybody always only did 32-bit x 6 emulation for BIOS graphics. So how do you use all of this? I mean, now that you have your shiny ARM server and you just got one and you want to really go in and plug in some graphics card and drive that during boot up and this is the biggest wish that you ever had, uh, it's very easy. You just uh, grab the Git repo that we did and uh, run these few instructions. That they're documented on the Git repo, don't worry. Uh, and then you're good to go. You can basically just plug in anything. It's fully compatible with pretty much everything we have. Uh, if, as long as your code is based around ADK2, which pretty much all the commercial firmware pieces are, it just works. So with that, want to see it live? All right. So we want to have an ARM system and then plug in, the easy case here for me was not a graphics card, but was a network adapter. So you want to plug a network adapter in and then just boot from that network adapter. But the network adapter has an x86 option ROM, right? So we need to emulate that, which unfortunately my notebook is not ARM, so I'm actually running all of that again in a virtual machine. So we now have an x86 virtual machine emulating an ARM system, emulating an x86 option ROM, calling into ARM code, calling into... You get the idea. <laughs> so what that looks like is that if you run the not emulated version, If you want the not emulated version, um, you can see that the virtual machine boots up and it runs EDK2 and it shows you, well, I have these block devices and I couldn't really find anything to boot from. Uh, what do you want to do? Well, I do have a network controller, an E1000E over here, but it couldn't really do anything with it, right? It couldn't uh, drive it. Can you read this even? Well, I guess you can read that one better, right? So it couldn't even load the driver. There's like basically no trace that this device had an option on that we could even execute. Now, if we go with the emulated version, you will see it boots up as well, right? And then it goes and tries to start Pixie boot, which obviously succeeds because we have an emulated TFTP server, and that can run Grub, which then again shows you a graphical user interface to boot a random distribution from, and then if you really cared, you could go and actually run an emulated, don't do that. It takes forever. But it means we now we're loading, or we actually are loading the kernel and inner daddy using grub, that just X, which, is, which is ARM, via an x86 network adapter driver running in our ARM UEFI code running on an x86 host. Turtles all the way down. will take forever. Questions? This was faster than I expected. Uh, we need a microphone. <laughs> you woke him up. Uh, I get the microphone. <laughs> just real quick. No. So wait, that's just for UFA, UEFI, right? Yes, that's for just emulation. for UEFI. So as soon as you get into the kernel, then for emulating, can you still access the uh, x86, or how does the driver work when you get into the kernel side? So we're getting into, into those details. Um, it's, you need to understand how UEFI works to really draw that full picture. Okay. Well, um, what you usually do is, uh, you have a couple of cases. You have, for example, uh, the graphics card case. Right? In the graphics card case, what happens is that uh, you have your graphics card driver set up something called the GOP, the Global you know, Graphics Output Protocol, mm -hmm. Graphics Output Protocol, and then Linux on boot up remembers the frame buffer address from the GOP, so it evaluates all the objects that are in the system, finds out, oh, I actually have a graphics output protocol, let me remember that address that the frame buffer was on and the resolution that thing is on, and how to drive it, and then it, it just puts that into side information, and then when Linux comes up, the EFI frame buffer driver pulls that information and actually drives the frame buffer from Linux. So even without a runtime graphics card driver, you can drive your graphics card using the UEFI framework. You just cannot set any uh, new resolutions because that code is all gone. So you're still using your emulator. But you, you're actually not using the emulator at that point because this is, at that point, you really just have a frame buffer to write to, oh. right? 
Um, so the emulator is all gone. I mean, once, once you exit, once, once you go into Linux, the emulator is completely gone. There is no emulator left. But you can still drive hardware that was set up before. And that actually is really, really useful. It sounds like a toy project, really, at the end of the day. But for graphics card, this is crucial because a lot of drivers in Linux even expect that graphics initialization happened before Linux came up. And this initialization never happens if you don't run the option ROM. So with, by running the option ROM, you actually have much more stable graphics drivers in Linux, even though they're not getting emulated anymore, just because that just happened to initialize some internal register state that otherwise wouldn't get initialized. Um, there's another case, which if you want to get into that detail, um, who wants to get into network card details? Okay, let's do more drivers first. Uh, no, more, more questions first, and then if we have time, I, I can talk network drivers too. So Marek was second. Just quick. No. Yep, it's on now. Yeah, so I have a question about the TCG. Um, since the option ROM is uh, x86, right? The option ROM is x86, yes. So x86, 64. Is it possible to feed the option ROM into the TCG, convert it into ARM code, so that you wouldn't have to do the switching between x86 and ARM on the function boundary? Or does that make no sense at all? I don't fully understand the question, but, I think. Well, basically, you would, you would do, dump do you the option later? ROM, convert it into ah. ARM code with the TCG, and then just call it natively. Would that if make sense or not? Pre-compilation is always hard because you cannot uh, do self-modifying code. Right? If you pre-recompile pre -re pre any architecture to another architecture, it's always the same problem. Um, you basically lose the ability to, to patch yourself, which is crucial for things like relocations, which we don't have in, in UEFA Island usually, but at least I don't, I don't know what all those proprietary drivers do. Right? So giving them a safe model is probably the better idea. You could maybe get away with pre-translating, I didn't try. Even with, if you're translating CISC, you don't even know where the instructions start. So David's argument was, uh, when you're translating CISC, you don't even know where instructions start. You, you know the entry points, so you definitely know the instruction flow. It's just because everything's a function pointer that just makes every, I mean, the, this approach, I mean, we did this within, so we had to now connect uh, I did not want to touch any EDK2 code, so I, I told Art I would be happy to work with you on this, but I, I'll do emulation, you do you, firmware. Um, so he went away and just did the whole no execute trick thing that we talked about earlier. Uh, in, well, he basically sent me a working tree on Sunday, so it took him two days. Um, and then I spent two days trying to find something that is not TCG and gave up, eventually used TCG and on Wednesday had graphics working. So this is a really, really easy and simple thing. It really is, I mean, just take existing code, put it together and be done. Whereas pre ahead of time recompilation is very hard to get right. So another thing that I think makes recompilation almost impossible is that you don't know where the protocol boundaries are. You don't know which protocols are ARM and which protocols are x86, so that sucks. You, you could create thunks somewhere in between. You could do the no execute trick again, but then you would still have to have a dynamic recompilation engine or at least some translation engine between things. It would get really messy. I mean, and, and the whole ABI is too different, right? With the whole things where, where parts are written in stacks and where other parts are not written in stacks, it's, it just makes it hard. It, static recompilation is just really, really hard to get right. Uh, I think you were next, right? Yeah, uh, that kind of problem was supposedly to be fixed by using UEFI bytecode. Uh, did that happen at some point? It, it would, uh, wouldn't help for... Um, there is something called EBC, uh, which is the EFI bytecode. <laughs> uh, who has heard of EBC? Oh, that's actually way more than I expected. Um, you could definitely give history lessons. Uh, the, so EBC, what happened with EBC is Intel had a, had a problem back then when they did Titanium, that they had a 64-bit architecture and a 32-bit architecture. And they wanted to write option ROMs that run on both. So what they ended up doing is they invented something called EBC, the EFI bytecode, or maybe it's only called extensible bytecode, I have no idea, but it's basically, it's EBC. And uh, EBC is, a completely written from scratch 
bytecode thing where you have your own set of registers and your own set of instructions, everything its own, with a few caveats. Uh, so EBC has a dynamic length of pointers, which means size of is a function call. If you've ever tried to teach any modern compiler that size of is a function call, <laughs> It's basically impossible. So there was a compiler from, from Intel um, that allowed you to generate EBC because Intel drove EBC back then. Uh, and that one has been discontinued for the last 10 years, roughly. Uh, so that one is pretty much dead. Uh, there was something from Microsoft. I'm not quite sure what they did, but they completely abandoned EBC as well. Uh, they will, Microsoft will refuse to sign EBC binaries. So everything that is signed boot is just gone at that point, right? You, you cannot sign your, your stuff anymore, which means you will have to have signed x86 binaries in your option ROMs anyways. And at that point, you can as well just put native ARM option ROMs in your, not native ARM binaries in your option ROMs, so you don't get any benefit from doing EBC, right? So really what it boils down to is that the ideal solution is that your adapter, your, your card provider, just provides both x86 and ARM native option ROMs. UEFI has all the interfaces for that. You can have multiple option ROMs within a same, Sunday, within a same uh, option ROM blob, and then it just finds the right one for its architecture and uses that preferredly. Uh, but using EBC didn't actually give you any advantages. Right? Um, I would much rather have x86 be considered the new EBC at least for 60-bit architectures, because really that's what it boils down to. So Linao had a, uh, a project a while back uh, to actually port, have a, what is it, LLVM, I think, an LLVM backend for, for EBC. So you could generate EBC from LLVM, so you can put C code in, LLVM generates EBC bytecode, with one caveat. It would hard code size of long or size of pointer to 64-bit. Uh, which means, again, you don't gain anything over x86-64 as your bytecode because all those 60-bit ABIs are basically the same. They look really very pretty much identical. So there's, there's no benefit to it. Uh, you were next. I think you have a microphone. Yes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about TCG. So if I understood correctly, you link TCG with your UFI firmware. Mm. Or yes and no. Okay. Uh, or it's is it it's the same, same same as any library, right? Okay. Um, when you when you have a binary and you have a library, you also link them together, but only during runtime. Okay. So it's dynamic linking. It basically is dynamic linking. Uh, so that means that if I have an ARM server, I have to install a new firmware that that's linked with your modifications. You need two things. You need the emulator protocol, which is in the core. So you actually need new firmware regardless. So you can, it, it, it doesn't work just only as an add-on because the hooks in the, in the core to actually say when I load a binary and the PE header says different architecture, don't bail out, instead ask me instead. Those, those hooks just don't exist without the emulator protocol. That one is on its way to upstream EDK2 right now. So patches are on the list, under review, et cetera, et cetera. Um, once that is in, anybody who pulls from EDK2 basically has those, and then you only need to add that additional emulator. They might do it on themselves too, so we're planning to put the uh, emulator as a pre-compiled binary, including source reference and everything, but as a simple to easy to consume uh, pre-compiled binary, so you don't have to worry about compiler versions, because compiling TCG with other compilers is not as easy. Um, EDK2 needs to be compiled with Microsoft Visual C, right? I mean, you want, you want a pre-compiled binary um, to consume uh, into the non-OSI repository from EDK2 so that everybody who creates firmware can just go in and says, yeah, I want, I want this emulator, and then they just chip it. So that means that it's not, it's not just a proof of concept, but future ARM servers this is usable. might ship this. Uh, they they might the eventually ship okay. it, yes. Actually, I, I know of one ARM server that ships this. I don't know if it's this. It, it ships an x86 emulator. I haven't dissected it to see if it's that one. Okay, thank you. So the, the whole time you've been talking about ARM, I think you've been actually talking about ARM 64, yes. right? Have, have you, is, but because you're passing through QMU, there's no reason this shouldn't work for ARM 32 as well, right? Uh, <laughs> that gets, gets us back to all the other slides about uh, having the same structure layouts. 
Right, so those 64 bit pointers. If you, once you dive into 32 bit land, structure layouts are basically a wild west. In 64 bit land, it's easy, right? It's, it's, I mean, they basically all look the same. You have the same padding constraints because all modern CPU <coughs> architectures look the same uh, under the hood. But the uh, 32 bit ones are just all bets off. There's, there's, I mean, your ARM data structures might or might not, to some extent, be similar to your x86 data structures. Just don't know. But it's, it's, I mean, even 1% miss is fatal, right? You'll see it, alignment will be wrong at that point. I wanted, I wanted to say that I completely agree with you with uh, considering uh, x86 as the new standard code because um, I have an alpha server at home, which I have not used for a while, uh, and in, it implements uh, x86 emulation in the, in the boot code. And I was very surprised when I first saw my Matrox VGA card uh, show up and the uh, Adaptec uh, SCSI card uh, being configurable completely. And both of these cards did not work in a Sun, in, on a Spark station, uh, and they worked perfectly on this machine. I tend to consider that this such boot code or initialization code is heavily proven in uh, x86 servers and that there is no need to rewrite it using a different uh, language or arch architecture or whatever and it's preferable to simply emulate it uh, like you do. I agree. I mean, the, the, the best way is still to have native code, right? Whatever you do, native code is always best because that gives you the best guarantees also for other slight nuances of architectures like cache coherency issues and well, into DMA transfers and out of order stores and such. So you, you ideally want to have native code, but if you don't have native code, x 6 is the closest approximation that is sensible to make because you cannot expect people to write bytecode. It just won't happen. Is there actually industry momentum to provide native code for these option ROMs for, for ARM64? Uh, so, Cavium, for example, does that for all new adapters. Um, I know that Mellanox allows you to choose by now, so you can have SKUs with uh, ARM and with uh, x86 bytecode, x86 code. Um, I don't know about the others. So, for GPUs, I don't know of a lot of use cases where people actually use GPUs in ARM server chips. Uh, the markets just don't overlap too well. I mean, you don't want to have a big gaming rig based on an ARM CPU that doesn't run your games. Maybe for mining. Uh, yeah. So the main use of this is uh, IPXE, it's PXE. The, the main use really is graphics cards. Um, I just graphics. couldn't couldn't show. Uh, I, IPXE was just a simple example because the in QMU uh, we don't differentiate the option ROMs based on the target architecture. So we assume that PCI adapters are always the same, to, to un, regardless on where you plug them in, which means that the, uh, the option ROM that was in the, e in the emulated E1000 just happened to be x86, so it was really, really easy to show. But the, the, real, like the actual use case you want, you're looking for is, uh, and, and in QME we might provide our native ARM versions too eventually, I mean, there's, there's very little reason not to. But the real use case is uh, VGA biases on actual hardware. So the, what Suse is after is the first three seconds to get a screen? So yes. You get a yes, first three seconds to get a screen, which on servers is not three seconds. The Thank first you. half hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, it, it is crucial because our, um, we, we have but the, the reason I keep pushing for UEFI things and standardized interfaces for firmware um, is that we actually have something like snapshot boots that is crucial for customers where they want to roll back to previous versions of an installation. Uh, and for that, you need to show something during boot. You need to actually allow people to customize the boot path they want to take. And doing that without showing graphics when they do plug in graphics is hard. I was wondering if your work induced any change into the QMU project, or did you, did you consume it like this? Uh, okay, there, there are a couple of caveats about that. Um, the first is that uh, the overall QMU code base is GPLv2 only, pretty much. 
um, because we do have some GPL v2 only pieces in there which pull down the rest into GPL v2 only code. That means we, I mean, things like QOM, the QMU object model, that one is GPLv2. Um, and that one is integrated in everything because everything wants to be an object inside QMU, and so you basically automatically become GPLv2. Um, for this, I wanted to make sure we really are not GPL. I, mean, I, I am a really big open source advocate, and I love open source, but I don't want to get into legal, I don't even want to remotely be considered in legal problems between running this emulator and some other native piece of code that maybe is even the optional. I mean, could I prove that they don't have any cross dependencies? I, I, don't, I don't want to get into those, those discussions. So uh, that's why I wanted to make sure it's LGPL, which means I couldn't flow back into upstream QMU. Um, it also wouldn't make sense to have it flow back into upstream QMU because it is a completely different target, uh, which most of it is, I mean, this, this really is just this self-contained TCG thing that is done. x86-64 is not going to change a lot. AH-64, the backend is working. We, we have as fast as you can be, almost. It's, there's, there's no reason to improve that code. It's just there to stay. And uh, so we, we didn't ha really have any reason to, to integrate with the upstream QMU project on this. Uh, I just don't see big benefits, this main reason. I mean, if, if, it, if it was beneficial, I would always push it back. I mean, I do QMU develop it, right? So it's, it's good to contribute back, but in this case, it just didn't make sense. Marek. So did you just pull out the DCG code out of the QM code base, yes. or did, did yes. you clone it from somewhere else? How, do, how does the interaction between DCG and QM actually look? <laughs> uh, so TCG has a, has a really nice history. Um, does anyone know of TCC? Yes. Ah, the tiny code compiler. Uh, Fabrice Bayard, well, Bla, I don't know, my French is terrible, um, wrote a C compiler a while back uh, to really fast just compile C code and have output. And the backend that he used to actually generate that C code, that is what became TCG and QMU. So the original code base for that whole generator was actually self-contained from the first place. Which means that all we need to do, needed to do was basically rip all the object model pieces that got in afterwards out and we're done. It already was self-contained. There was nothing that really had to be ripped. Plus I've done a lot of work on TCG before, so I did know that code base a bit. That helped. More questions? Well then, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>